Hi friends, welcome again to another episode of Soaring Through Chaos. And the purpose of this, um, of all these talks is to find ways to have a meaningful life. Especially during these chaotic times, we are now in the second wave of, uh, of the pandemic. It's definitely not easy. Some of us are going through health challenges. Some are going through economic challenges. And many of us are going through loneliness, anxiety, upset, anger. These are all things that we don't normally like. So many of us are out of our comfort zone. But if you listen to the therapists, if you listen to counselors, if you even listen to religious leaders, they all say the same thing. It's when we go through difficulties, it's when we go through really hard times, when we are out of our comfort zone, if we are able to maintain our calm, then we evolve, then we get to our next level of evolution. And here with me is an amazing person I got to know during the, at the beginning of the pandemic in Mexico. Yes, I was actually in Mexico as the pandemic was, you know, taking grip. I was going to visit only for three weeks, but it ended up being three months because my mother country, my motherland, India got into a lockdown and the place where I live, California, also went into shelter in place. And it was friends like Valeria who helped me through my time, helped me learn Espanol and uh, amazing things. So Valeria, welcome. It's so nice to see you here. It's been more than five weeks since we have talked, since I came back to India. How have you been? Como estas? Estoy muy bien. Hi, Shankar. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, and, I'm very good. And I'm grateful because, um, you know, I came to a country knowing that there was the risk of the pandemic uh, because I'd seen it in South Korea before I came to America. And I knew America was going to lockdown, but I did not want to be locked. So I came to Mexico. And in Mexico, we really didn't have a lockdown, but we no, not being careful, not so. being very careful. Yes. Yes. So how are things right now in Mexico? How are, how are things coming along with you, with your friends? Pretty much the same as when you left. Um, really? There's, there's not such thing as a lockdown. Um, people go out, now everything is open. And, and, and it's scary because the numbers are rising and the government doesn't do much. And here we are. We are, I, am, I have been for four months in a lockdown now. Wow. Um, so you're, the lockdown you're, is hmm? most people are locking down voluntarily, taking care of themselves. Is that correct? Yes, but but that's a decision that we make as individuals, but not as a not as a collective, not as a country, not as the government isn't telling us to to stay home. Uh, on the contrary, everything is open now: restaurants, oh. shopping malls. Everything is open. Even malls, theaters, everything is open? Yes. Wow. Yes. At wow. this moment, yes. Uh, they, they don't let you um, go inside for long periods of time. You have to go there just like for an hour, I believe, or so. And just one person per family and all, but it's open. It's open. Wow, in yeah. the malls. Actually, because the, uh, the economic blow is, is terrible. And yeah. in, in countries like ours, it's worse. Yeah, it's, it's very similar in India uh, because of economics. Um, most things are open. Uh, malls are also open uh, in a limited way, in similar restrictions. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, people are getting more and more careful. Uh, uh -huh. It's hard even to believe whether the numbers are right or wrong, but people are cautious. Uh, yeah. As soon as I step out, I use a mascarilla. Um, uh, yes. So it's all actually, um, in fact, even the Prime Minister of India urged everybody to become self-reliant. Uh, the word is Atma Nirvar. So take responsibility for your own health, for your own happiness. Yeah, because uh, don't, because it's a lot of people. We have 1.3 billion people and the country is not even double the size of Mexico. So we are, uh -huh. our population is five times of Mexico. 
and uh, five times. Five times. Huge. Uh, no, huge. no, no. Actually, our country is our population is ten times. Your yeah. Mexico is only one hundred and thirty million. And uh, and India, India is a thousand. Sorry. India is a thousand. More people. than that, one point three billion. So one thousand three hundred million. Wow, it's ten times the most. Uh, and size-wise, India may be about sixty seventy percent bigger, but it's not much bigger than Mexico. So it's but hard. it's very populated. M much more crowded. Yeah, yeah. And uh, even in America, I mean, you know, it's not easy at all right now. Um, but uh, but life goes on, and that reminds me, uh, we. So it was really nice meeting you, and I'm so grateful that you put together a, a gathering the very the day after I arrived in um, Seattle, the Mexico. You put together a gathering of neuroscientists, positive psychologists, and social workers. Can you tell me what inspired you to bring all of us together? Yes, um, it it was amazing because you told me you were coming to Mexico and. Everything was starting to shut down in Mexico when you were coming. So I was like really scared. I was terrified of you coming here. Um, <clears throat> I had already put on the social media the, the invitation for the workshop. And, and I knew no one was going to show up. No one. So I, I decided to make it like very small gathering of people in a house. So uh, Adela Salinas. Uh, lended us her her house. She she's so welcoming. She's a great friend of mine. She's an amazing woman, and so I sent the invite for a few friends, and I said, whoever needs to be there will be there. Uh, coronavirus or not, we will show up because something inside of me was telling me that I had to go on with this, but I was scared. Um, we were not very sure of how the contagion was going to spread and if we had it or if we don't or if we didn't. There, there were, there were <clears throat> sorry, there was no use of cubrebocas and all the protective measures, remember? So we all got there a Saturday morning and we all were scared, right? Um, yeah, and yeah. We all were like, should we hug? Should we kiss? Should we keep our distance? Uh, what should we do? And we sat down and every, every one of us were like very uncertain and very, and you helped us all to break that fear. That was so important. That, that was a huge breakthrough for me because you showed us how to not manage the fear, but how to connect with it or not, right? Well, I let me put it slightly differently. We, we together well, understood that our biggest challenge was not the virus. It was, was the ourselves. virus within us. That, that we were, the fear, the anxiety, the restlessness, the anger against the government, the upset against foreigners coming and infecting us, all the negativity was infecting us. Yes. I, I don't think it was me. It, I think it was we. We all together realized yes. it. Yes. Because the, the, the whole group consisted of people who were doing social work, like uh, Elena herself, and yes. people who worked on children's abuse, and like Adelaida. you and uh, Elena Laguarda, and Adelaida, yes. who understood the science, the neuroscience of the Enneagram. So yes. it was an amazing group of people. It was, and we collectively it was, understood that our problem was not outside, it was in here. Yes. And then we were able to rest in it, isn't it? It was amazing, that it was, was magical. I came with a lot of fear myself. Because yes, I didn't know Espanol. Are. And I knew that by that time, India was shutting down and California was shutting down. And yes. I could not leave the country. Yes, I know. I could not even go to Guatemala or across the border to America. So, so we all came with our anxieties and concerns, isn't it? it? And it was really, it was magical because it was, um, we together as a collective, I believe we, we put the foundation for what was coming. 
at, at least that was for me. Yeah, um, me too. We understood that we, need to, we needed to work in ourselves, not to vibrate in fear. And the, the, um, the consciousness from that group really led me on for the months to come that were going to be very difficult. Yeah, and, and tell us about that. I mean, if you can, uh, it was hard. I, I saw a lot coming through. My job was easier. All I had to learn was Espanol. Yes, your job to do was just be available to all. It was easy, much easier. Your yeah. job was very easy, but it, it was also hard because you were lonely. And I was worried that you were lonely in a in a house, in a yeah. you know, in a new country. country but, with a foreign language. But honestly, you and uh, the whole group of uh, 10 of you made it very, like, um, uh, I want to thank uh, Maria Cristina, uh, yes. you know, Danielle, Danielle. Um, and my friends in Chihuahua like Liliana and um, Tanya and Dayanira, everyone made it welcoming, you know. Um, so many people and every single person, they were- We are a welcoming country, right? <laughs> and very we, could, we could not meet because uh, everybody went into a self lockdown. The government was not stopping us, but no. we all became cautious. It wasn't the government. And you are the, the few people that I saw, remember, Yes. Remember that we met. We met like two, twice uh, after that. What twice yeah. after that? Yeah. Very carefully, and I yeah. remember even um, the housekeeper in my home, uh, uh, Rosaria. She also had the symptoms, and uh, then I had to tell her not to come for six weeks because yes, she had severe scared, symptoms. Right? And I'm so grateful that you and Maria Cristina and Danielle were supportive to Rosario because Rosario needed the money and all I told her was don't worry about the money just take care of yourself. Yes I know. It's hard to have COVID symptoms and uh, thank God she only had fever and uh, cough and cold she did not get pneumonia. And yes she, I know. She did fine. I but know. Uh, it was because of you and uh, all of you and, and me learning Espanol that we were able to support her from a distance. Yes. And you were, su you were very supportive, supportive of me. Incredibly supportive through a very tough period of my life. Well, uh, tell us more about what you went through. And I mean, you're doing, I feel you're doing great, but tell us how you're feeling, you know, the challenges you went through, if you want to share. Yes, absolutely. Um, when, when I was starting the, the pandemic, the lockdown or everything, um, I decided to go to spend it with my sister in, in Cabo and to take both my parents because they, they were part of the risk population. They were old. My mom had a respiratory disease. Um, and so I took both my parents, got on the plane with all the safety measures. Everybody thought I was crazy. I was thinking so too. But we went to Cabo and over there it was much easier. Life was much simpler, much easier. There, there was not so much panic and people were not so afraid. So we, we stayed in lockdown for two weeks at my sister's house and after that it was pretty easy. Uh, I mean, uh, there was a garden, the outdoors, it was, we were all together as a family. And I said, this is great. This is great. We're going to have a great time. I, I was still working from, in, from a distance and everything was doing great. And one day my mother um, woke up and she said she was in a lot of pain. And so we took her to the doctor and to make a long story short, um, doctors diagnosed, um, cancer. It turned out at the end that it wasn't cancer, but she was very ill. And I, I believe she had been very ill for a long time. Um, and she was very strong because we, we never noticed, not even her. But we took care of her for the last two months and then she passed away uh, about a month and a half ago. And it was 
the toughest period of my life because I knew she was going to die. From the moment I heard of the diagnosis, I knew she was going to, to pass away. And I told you, remember, and you, and you said I didn't have that much time left with her. So the pandemic and the virus and everything just flew out the window and my only concern was her taking care of her and making sure that she was fine. And it was, it was a gift of life in a way because she got to say goodbye to all of us. She, we, we all were surrounded her, surrounding her. We, it was a very loving and caring environment. Uh, my nieces were there with her, my sister, and it was an, a unique opportunity to be, to be together. Uh, if it was another time of period of life, none of us would have had so much time to just be with her. So it really was a gift. It was a gift from heaven to be able to spend all the time with her, just with her. And, and then we came back to Mexico and that was around two months ago. And We've been here ever since. Now we are in a lockdown. <laughs> now we're in, at the house. We don't leave here just to go shopping and, and then we come back. I live with my son and, and I'm grieving my mother and I'm uh, working and I'm trying to do the best I can. And that's the story. <laughs> and, and I, you were, I also you know, well, recall Rodrigo, the teenager, he was going through his teen test. Now he's doing great. Now you, are yeah. the, 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 you seem to be very, very close to each other. Very close. We, we yeah, yeah, that, that also, <laughs> I forgot. Yes, yes, that yeah. was also very, very tough because when we met, remember, I was not speaking to, to my son. He was, he 16. And he was angry at me and he left. So I, I stopped speaking to him and seeing him for three months. So it hasn't been the best year for me <laughs> so far. It's been, it's been kind of a trial in all senses. And you were there for me the whole time. I cannot well, thank you. Enough. Well, thank you for saying that, uh, you know, um, muchas gracias. I mean, uh, and um, uh, look at it this way. Um, we are all there for each other. If I was just alone, I would be so bored. As you said, I was in a different country away from all friends and family. I practically knew like three people in the whole nation when I came out. And those are three people I'd met in India and for like a few hours. So I really got to know those three people and they were in Chihuahua. Mm -hmm. Nobody was in um, Mexico City and I was in Cuernavaca, not even in Mexico oh, City. I was one hour away in Morelos. Yes. yes. So, so for me, it was, it was really a joy to be, just be present. And um, I didn't have much to worry about except learning to cook, which I did. You had such an amazing kitchen to, to learn to cook. It was an amazing kitchen. I'm so grateful to Adilis Walker and her husband, Estefano, who just uh -huh. let me stay because uh, they could have said, I mean, I had said I would only stay two weeks. And both are doctors in San Francisco. And they said, you're not going anywhere. Just stay there. Yeah, you, you stay there. To, you cannot go to India. You cannot, please don't come to California. Things are not good here. Just stay there. And Cuernavaca is like closest to heaven. It's so beautiful. It's paradise. It's, it's really paradise. paradise. You had a swimming pool. You had the beautiful trees and the garden and everything. You were like, yeah. Every day I was walking and looking at new plants and like jacarandas and, uh, you know, tamachines and, uh, uh, you know, I was counting the number of trees and Amazing, totally amazing. It's the yes. eternal, the city of eternal spring, Guanavaca. Yes, so, that is correct. I mean, um, so I literally lived in paradise. I even wrote a short essay called Quarantined in Paradise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. It was an amazing place. 
Paradiso o Quarantine, something like that. <laughs> ah, no, 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 no. Cuarentena en el paraíso. Cuarentena en paraíso. Yes. Cuarentena yes. en paraíso. Yeah, it was amazing. It was totally amazing. And um, then again, I became friends with all my neighbors, uh, young men who were very interested in learning about life. And uh, they wanted to know about uh, India. They had been studying about uh, uh, the Indian uh, you know, philosophies, Buddhism and Hindu and uh, um, amazing. So we even had uh, uh, conference calls with uh, Anne, Anne Watts, Alan Watts' daughter. So it was just amazing. Uh, and many more. had a great time. Yeah, but on the other hand, I had to literally build community because uh, I came not knowing anyone. I know. Uh, and um, by the time I left, we were all in tears. I had 10 friends right in my neighborhood. Everybody from Pablo to, uh, you know, uh, Rodrigo, Rodrigo right? another Rodrigo. And um, yeah, it was just three, Tonio, um, you know, uh, and um, I did not even come on to come back, but my wife was here in India. And so uh, I decided, and I luckily I landed home on my 32nd anniversary, marriage anniversary. So, really? <laughs> yes. yes, I remember. Congratulations. Which was sweet. Which was sweet. But uh, so uh, my question to you is this. You went through definitely one of the most challenging periods of your lifetime. Yes. Losing your mother, being, you know, facing the, the teen challenges, you know, adolescence of your son. And now you're so close to each other. And yes. Well, taking care of your sister and her family also. You know, it's not easy. But what I found amazing was that many people would have given up or started crying and like getting upset. You had none of that. You were able to stay calm. So all the things you've learned in your life, you, you actually talk about not being a victim. And a lot of your books, your work is about helping people. And yes. I, I saw you putting it to use, putting it to good use. Not easy, but real. <laughs> okay. Yes. You cannot pretend to be happy when your, your mother is passing away. You cannot yes. pretend to be happy when you're having a conflict with your own son. No. But to no. be able to see that, to be able to face that is an amazing thing. Yes, so can I you believe tell us about how you faced it and What's your work about? What do you do? I mean, you're doing some amazing things in your life. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I'm in love with my work. That definitely. Um, uh, around eight years ago, I started, um, I came, I came across uh, children's literature and I started to build uh, a brand of books for kids. And very soon I realized that kids needed a lot of help in dealing with emotions and in dealing with tough, uh, difficult periods of time of their lives, of, with all the challenges that modern life presented them. And, and also the parents. We as parents are not, we are at a loss at knowing what to, how to raise our kids how to face difficult problems, like losing a grandfather, for instance. Um, so I decided to make uh, children's books, but with a message or with, uh, uh, yes, with a message or with a story that really helped kids travel through life in an easiest or easier way. Um, so I, I began that journey and I, discovered my life purpose completely and I came across so many wonderful people that were so um, involved in making that happen in in writing stories for children to help them with uh, divorce of the parents with grief with anxiety with a lot of different kinds of of very challenging problems. One of them, um, one that is a huge problem in Mexico is uh, child abuse, uh, child molestation and sexual abuse. So um, I met Elena 
many, many years ago, but we started to work together around seven years ago when we came together to uh, publish the first book of Adi, of, of, sorry, of Ati. I was, of Ati, which is called Ati, El Dragón de las Estrellas. That was the first book of a series that grew um, um, I, 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 me trabe, I'm sorry. That was the first book of a series of five books. And I worked with Elena now, we are working much closer in developing that project. That, that's a huge project based on preventing child abuse. Um, so that's pretty much the story. But behind that story, uh, there was my child, my kid. He was seven years at the time. He himself was struggling with a lot of emotional issues and a lot of challenges because he was very, very, very smart kid. And he was a little bit misunderstood. Uh, he didn't get along very well with his peers. He suffered bullying at school. And I realized that I needed to help him the best way I could. And I also needed to help other children. So that, that was one of the main reasons that I decided that that was my life challenge. And now here I am. I'm, I'm publishing a lot of children's books that will help them face different challenges in life. And interestingly, if I may add, uh, I was learning basic Espanol and these children's books were my first books that I started reading. <laughs> like, Ati, Corazón de Cristal and things like that. <laughs> and every time I would learn, read a few lines to you, to Elena, to yes. Maria Cristina, and they would say, oh, instead of saying Cristal, you say Cristal. Or, yeah. Corazón. Um, yeah. Many, many things. And... Um, it was amazing. First, the, the stories were really exquisite and very nice. It's, yes. like, it's like Disney storybooks, but with a purpose, which is um, overcoming uh, abuse, making children emotionally resilient and stronger to be yes. able to understand, identify, and face difficulties and abusive situations. Yes, so, a very challenging world. And to be able to do that with stories, I've never seen it anywhere else or in any other language. And so my hope is that, uh, that we'll be able to find publishers to translate these books in all cultures because uh, child abuse that. is very common around the world. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's a huge problem worldwide. worldwide. In it's Mexico, we are, the, we are the number one country. I don't know. I don't know. Or so it seems. That's what it seems, but no, we're not seems, sure. Yeah. Um, yes. We hear the same in India. A lot of child abuse, sexual abuse, um, child labor. You know, um, it's not easy. And even in America, uh, there are so many problems that children go through: loneliness, broken families. Uh, yeah, uh, children really are common. are the most vulnerable. Well, globally, they're. The, one of the most vulnerable populations in the world. And, and we as adults have the great responsibility to make life easier for them, or at least less dark. And I, I believe we have a huge responsibility because they're the future of the world. And, and right now, the world isn't looking very bright for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So uh, Valeria, one question that comes to mind is that society has so many expectations from mothers and women in general. On one hand, we have the patriarchy in most places in the world. Men still think that they're ruling the whole world, which is not always true, which is actually meaningless. But on the other hand, every child has expectations from the mother. And there's so much, um, how should I say, there's a lot of responsibility 
but not enough authority for women. How do you feel about it? And I know you've done a lot of work on on women and women's rights. What do you? What's your take on that? Um, yeah, funny you mentioned it. Uh, just before the pandemic, the I, I believe it was the previous weekend. Um, there was a huge movement in Mexico, well, worldwide, but it was like starting to form and we had a, um, a huge uh, march of women in, in Mexico City. And so I came together with Pamela Cerdeira, which is a great journalist. She's a very, very respected and a great friend of mine. And we, and she wrote a book and I published a book uh, called The Day the Women Disappeared because it was going to be a day without women. Uh, a Monday, no women were supposed to show up at, at school, at work, or anywhere in the street. It was like women's disappearance for a day. And the movement was really coming strong. And all of a sudden, the virus <laughs> came in and took over. <laughs> so, so the women movement got banished. <laughs> but still, we had that great book. It's an amazing book for girls, um, written by Pamela and illustrated by, by an excellent illustrator that's called Anabel Lopez. Um, I have the, the, the e-book because it, it was not published in a, in a physical paper book. It was just a digital book. I sent it to you, I believe, right? Yes, yes. Uh, I have it, but uh, one of these days we have to work on translating it into other languages. Yes, yes. Is it we, only in English as well, or is it only in Espanol? No, I only have it in, in, in Spanish, but I want to translate it definitely. Definitely. I, I've talked with Pamela. Yeah. That word, and I will let you know as soon as we have it. Sure, sure. But the role we women play in all this is, well, it's crucial. It's it's paramount because we are the pillar of society. I, I believe it's not presumptuous to say so because we raise kids and we work and we are spouses or lovers or friends or significant others <laughs> of men. Uh, and we have a lot of expectations. Um, and also we have a lot of responsibility. I believe that um, one of the things I, I realized very early at, in, in my children's life was the role I played in his life. Uh, he looked at me for almost everything. I was his role mother, model. Um, and you, you model the, a, a boy, you teach him how to relate to women and you also model a girl and you teach her how to relate to men so i mean also men do that but i'm right now i'm not I, i'm not a main a men hater at all on the contrary i love men they're great but right now i'm talking about the role we play okay yeah <laughs> um so it is, it is challenging. It is difficult. I don't believe that we are equal. Everybody, sorry for all, the, for all the feminists, but I don't believe we're equal. I believe we're different. We have equal rights. We should have equal rights. That's a fact. But we are not equal. And in Mexico, and as well as in India, there is a huge gap in, in rights. In, in, in human rights, in rights for women and rights for men, in salaries, in everything. So we, I, I hugely advocate for that movement to have equal rights. But the differences are, are so tangible, they're so evident, they're there. And um, we can talk about Mexico is also a place where there's, we, we are a lot of single women raising children. Also India, right? We are a lot of single no, women. No, India is different. Uh, in India, uh, at least in the middle class and the uh -huh. upper class, families stay together. But for the most part, it's women raising children. The men are always working or disappearing. Yes. <laughs> 
but uh, no, the divorce rate is still very low in India. Okay. In America, it's very similar, or it's it's probably Mexico. The divorce rate is much higher, and single moms is a very common thing. Very know? very common. We are a country made of single women raising children. Yeah. And, and being yeah. A of a family. Yeah. Um, I mean, that is definitely that true in the working class and the in the, the lower class in India also. Okay. It's about half the country. In the, in the middle and upper classes, right? In the middle and upper class, uh, uh, families at least on the surface stay together and uh -huh. uh, the, parents, the fathers are very much available. I would say okay. about half the country, the uh, parents, the fathers may not be, but at least half the country, uh, fathers are very much available for the children. My father was always there at home. Yeah, mine also. Mine also. My yes. father is great. My father is uh, such a loving and caring father. He, he's, he's great. But m many times the, the man is not around. And we have the huge responsibility of raising our children. And one of the things I, I, I realized and I came across is, is that all the emotional challenges that a kid has have a lot to do with the with the way his mother handles her emotions they're mirrors of our emotions so when we are women are not uh when we're not um when we don't have a healthy self-esteem when we're not um grounded in our feet when we're not at peace when we're frustrated when when we're facing fear, uh, anything, we transmit that to our children. And I don't think that many women are aware of that. Um, we are aware of putting food on the table and of many other things, but I'm not sure that many women are aware that we also have to transmit healthy emotions and um, it emotional intelligence to them. And starting with our own inner work. If we don't do that inner work and we are not whole, it's very, very unlikely that our children will be also uh, emotionally stable and whole. So it's a huge responsibility, not, uh, not only from the economical and social uh, standpoint, but also in the emotional standpoint, which I believe is the foundation of everything else. That's why I think it's so important to work in the self-esteem and to work in ourselves as women. We, it's, it, it's the, the basis of everything. If I go back to the, to the um, topic of, of my most important book series, which is uh, sexual abuse, it's also women abuse and it's also gender abuse and it all comes down to self-esteem. It all comes down to, uh, are you, do you agree with me? Oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent. In fact, uh, my, as, uh, one similarity you and I have is that uh, uh, we had mothers who had ups and downs in their life. And yes. no, no person, neither man nor woman, would ever be, um, you know, uh, would would purposely be mean to others, but when no, 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 no. When, but when they're going through pain, when they're going through misery, it's very difficult for them to be available. So my mom had her fair share of uh, uh, abuse in her childhood, which made it difficult for her to be a stable mom. You know what I mean? She had her yeah, challenges, yeah, and along when she would go up and down, we would too. Luckily, we had a father who was very stable and very caring, but he had to suffer too when my mother went up and down. The whole family would go up and down. So I fully agree with you that uh, in India, actually, there's a saying uh, in our traditions, in all Indian traditions, there's a saying that um, uh, 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 when, uh, when, the, when the woman of the house is happy, there's abundance in the house. If wow. the woman is unhappy, the, the household is poor, not just money-wise, but every in every possible way. In every sense, in every yeah, way. Yeah. In fact, the term used is Bhagya Lakshmi, which means um, the, the, 
the one who brings abundance to the home and and there are these incarnations of the goddess women are considered in traditional indian philosophy whether it's hindu or buddhist you know we see women and men as gods gods and goddesses and uh -huh, uh -huh. women are Killer are considered an embodiment of shakti or strength, uh -huh. like yes. um, courage, and the yes. second thing is of abundance and of wisdom. I, and that of wisdom. relationship between self-esteem and self-love and abundance is yes. indestructible. Yeah. So self-esteem is where without self-esteem you cannot be that courageous, strong. Uh, well, you know, I think, and without self-compassion and self-love, it's yes. difficult for us to have love for others, and there's a lot of insecurities. And abundance requires these things. Uh, if and love, not love. enough strength, and if there's not enough resilience, that it's difficult to grow. It is difficult to thrive. The Absolutely. first step to thriving, the first step to soaring. My the purpose of this series is so, soaring through chaos. How can we grow? But before we can grow, we have to feel strong and we have to feel loved. Yes. But if we can love starts with strong. yourself. Yes. Yes. So yes. I hundred percent agree with everything you're saying. And uh, that's yeah. I also agree with everything you say. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's why you. we're such a good such good friends right yeah we became friends on the phone uh, after jay jay chodagam introduced us and i'm so grateful to jay he's also yeah, me we are mentors to each other jay is just an amazing he guy is amazing jay is amazing also i love his work yes. I, i've been following his work through all the, the and he's been presenting meditations every single day online um, ever since the pandemic started he i know and he introduces different forms of meditation almost yes. every single day. Amazing guy. Which brings His life out series and all was amazing. Yeah. So which brings me to the challenges that we are all facing as humanity. These are difficult times. Let's let's face it. These yes. are times when a lot of us feel weak because of the potential for disease. We are, it's also because of economic destruction. There's so much all economies have become weaker. A lot of yes. people are feeling poor. They don't have enough money. Some people don't have money for food. Some people don't have money for a stable home. Um, and some people just, most of us are feeling less abundant. Let me put it that way. Yeah, yeah. It's a feeling of less abundance in the world, right? And any yes. anyone you talk to, you come across to is like, oh my God, uh, my, my job and my... It's yes. hard to come to to speak to speak to people that are doing great and the yes. business are thriving and all, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So my question to you is, um, what do you think? I mean, uh, do you see how we can make this time that we have meaningful? We cannot keep postponing life. We cannot say after the COVID is over, after the pandemic is, I'm going to do great. How no. do we face the here and now? And you have faced many difficulties in the last few months yes um no we, we do you have any ideas on how should we should go about taking care of ourselves and of others around us yes yes absolutely i believe that we need to focus on ourselves and to be strong ourselves we need to do whatever makes us happy <laughs> <laughs> whatever makes us happy, whatever makes us whole, like if, if it's a walk, if it's a hot bath, if it's reading a book or listening to music or having a glass of wine with a friend, even on Zoom, we need to do anything that makes us happy. And we need to cultivate a lot of inner peace and inner strength because that's all we have right now. We know that money isn't worth much at this time, cars, travels, it's a little bit in the second uh, range of life at this time. All we have is us and we have our community. We have our friends. I don't know what would, ha would, I, what would I, <laughs> what would I do without all my friends? 
they supported me through the saddest, saddest uh, time in my life. You can, you know, you can reach out to people um, and build a community like you did. So we need to be strong and to reach out for the people around us. <laughs> I hope I'm not boring you. <laughs> no, 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 it's late. And um, I've been up, you know, believe it or not, I've been doing like four interviews per day. Eight oh hours God. of my... <laughs> Oh my God, no, no, now you're tired, I know. I, and I, know. I don't get enough time to dance, but I danced for an hour today. <laughs> I see you dance and I like it so much. For instance, that's, that's something that makes you very happy. Yes. And it makes me happy to see you. And, and hearing people's stories. But I still need to about sleep at least six hours a day. So that's what <laughs> makes me sleepy. <laughs> six hours a day? I need minimum, to sleep by day. Yeah, six Seven, I'm happy. Six is minimum. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, yeah, please continue. Please continue. We need, we need to, to do anything we can to be strong as individuals. Um, this is a lesson. This is a life lesson. We can see it as something terrible, as a pandemic, as an economic crisis, and we can like watch the news and the numbers and the governments and, uh, or we can also take this time to focus on ourselves and to be better. Not to be better than anyone else, but to be better than ourselves the day before. I believe that's the challenge we need to face every single one of us. Even more if, we've, if we have children and if we have children that are looking out, down, down for us, for, for support, for inspiration, for... Uh, example, we need to be our best selves. So do anything you can to cultivate joy and happiness and anything that makes you feel okay, it's perfect. Not self-indulgence, no, no, no uh, going to the fridge and binging all day long, no. <laughs> but, but yes, trying to keep a healthy li lifestyle and make everything you can to be happy. We yes. know the importance of happiness, right? And of compassion. What it does to the brain. We know it in a, in a scientific perspective. And if that's so exactly I why I'm, I'm calling people like you who have faced reality. A um, lot of people are afraid, but like one of my closest relatives is in, his, is in a very difficult, uh, challenging time right now. He's 93 years old. And, um, the uncertainty just makes so many people nervous, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not yes. easy because most of the children are in America and this elderly, this elder is in India and uh, we get to see him every day. And I'm reminded of what you went through and I'm reminded all I have to do is be there and be, be loving. Yes. There's not much we can do to reduce his pain. And just being there is enough. Yes. And loving he's them. The, he's telling the stories from his childhood nowadays. Really? Yeah, because he's going through so much pain. And, um, you know, when somebody goes through a lot of pain, and whether it's through medicines or it's through just being with friends, there's a burst of oxytocin that happens sometimes. Yes. And, and, and then he suddenly opens up and tells stories from... 50 years ago, from 70 years ago. From That's because long-term memory is, is amazing. Yes. It, yes. it sticks with you through yes. your whole life. So, so much to learn from each other. That's why I, I'm open to listening to others. Usually yes, I'm not a great listener, but I've become a much better listener now. <laughs> I love the work you do, Shankar. I admire you so much. Uh, that, that workshop we did on, on compassion was really amazing. Well, you know, it's like, I, and I'm so grateful to my teachers, uh, whether it's the founder of Seacare, Dr. Jim Doty, uh, the TP, people who are my personal coaches, Dr. Margaret Cullen, uh, Erika Rosenberg, 
And they all became friends. Amazing. Kelly McGonigal. And of course, uh, when we were doing the workshop, Adelaida, Adelaida, yes. what's her full name? Uh, amazing lady. Uh, uh, I learned so much from her. Um, she even, I interviewed her. And in the middle of the interview, in a very gentle way, she was coaching. And wow. I, I heard like these epiphanies in the middle of uh, an interview like this. Wow. That's wow. amazing. La Fuente, right? Adelaida La, Harrison La Fuente, right? La Fuente? Her, yeah, something like that. But yes. amazing, amazing person. Uh, she's written a remarkable book. Uh, what is it? The Neuroscience of the Enneagram. This is the oh, first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Somebody, I love her book. Yes, yeah. it's amazing, her book. This is the first. This is the first time somebody has explored the Enneagram, which is an, from that point of view. looking at life from a neuroscientific perspective. Yes. And yes. how to use that to be able to, to rewire our brain, to rewire our heart, and to come back to ourselves. So, yeah, Adelaida has been a big support. She's a great wo woman. She's, she's really... I'm honored to have had the chance to meet so many a great, admirable woman, really. And that's all I do. That's all you do. We learn from each other and we share. Yes. And I'm, I'm so grateful that you've been publishing books. You've been publishing, uh, you know, uh, both hard copy books, PDFs. And my yes. hope is that every single thing that you've published in Espanol, in Spanish, becomes available in English and in, in many other languages as well. I will Trying to make sure that, that that happens. Yes, yes, and I'm I'm with you, and I know my friends are with you, because they're very unique, unique contributions about how to help children be emotionally resilient, how to become strong, how yes. to support women in their quest to, um, you know, to to have equal rights, and to be truly, you know, to bring out the feminine part of leadership. You know, I offer workshops on leadership. And more often than not, my work is to uh, alert both men and women, young men and young women, to embrace their own femininity, to embrace cooperation, kindness, uh, because the, the other part is easier, competitive, strong, visionary. It's harder to talk about cooperation, forgiveness, kindness, being gentle, being, being, being supportive. And yes. without that, you can't be a good leader. No, 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 absolutely. You, you, you don't lead by strength or by fear. You need to lead by example and by, by compassion. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, unfortunately, in today's world or in general in the world, these, uh, these attributes, these uh, qualities have been highly underrated. Yes. They're so, not valued. They're, they're simply not valued. Not valued. They're considered um, very, um, somehow they can say, oh, that's like mother's department. They're considered yes. not important. That's feminine. That's feminine. That's what, remember before the interview that we were talking about the patriarchy? Yeah. That's it. Region. But if you yeah. look at the greatest leaders on earth, um, if you, I mean, can you, I mean I, for me, it's like the Mahatma Gandhi, Abraham Lincoln. The biggest differentiator I see was their compassion and their gentleness. Yes forgiveness and so the, the feminine qualities were well developed even in these men yes uh, and Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela uh, Martin Luther King. Martin yes absolutely absolutely and thousands and thousands of leaders I mean uh, in more even in recent history um, Mother Teresa um, well, many of them yeah. uh, the Dalai Lama you know yes. what makes them great is inclusiveness cooperation bringing yes. collective wisdom not just i'm the greatest you know <laughs> we have many examples of people with way <laughs> too much, too much. I'm the greatest. <laughs> and we don't need any more of that <laughs> so we need more, more humble leader, leaders yes. right yes. not um yeah it's like we need, I, as i one phrase i learned was ustedes muy amable you know but we need that kindness. Each one of Please. us has that kindness. And how do we open up our arms 
even during the pandemic we cannot go hug but we can at least hug virtually you know yes. I'm there for you. <laughs> you you remember that we hugged during the pandemic after yes. after many hesitation yes we yes we yes. decided that we were going we were going to hug <laughs> and it's okay <laughs> okay yeah and, uh, and in fact um, uh, um uh, my friend ann watts who is big into touch therapy she says the least you can do is hug yourself oh <laughs> i love it people yes. are lonely just take yes. care of yourself very just be very careful lonely. and if you have a loved one in your family and you're safe and you're taking care make sure people hug each other because we need it we we cannot we won't survive without being touched whether it's physically emotionally socially yes we need love we need love to survive that's a that's the thing that we cannot not go on without yes yes and with that i think we'll conclude do you have any um, do you have any words to say goodbye to the people who are listening to us just that i love you you are a great friend i'm so glad i met you and i'm so thankful for you for this interview and for your time and for your words and for always being there for me really i love you shankar Mwah. thank you thank you te quiero yo también i'm practicing my espanol all the time <laughs> very, very well. my um, english was a little bit sloppy at times but <laughs> yeah yes, yes, yes. it came out okay. and i want to say that to everybody who's listening te quiero i mean uh, how do you say it uh, sorry yo también te quiero i love you too Wow, wow. Because uh, without people listening to us, I mean, these dialogues would not be very useful. So if anybody wants to contact me, I, you know how to find me. How about Valeria? What's the best place that people can contact you if they have any questions? Is that you a website Facebook. or your social media? What's the best way to contact you? Yes, Facebook, Valeria Leduc, or Instagram also, Valeria Leduc. I can share them with you later. Okay? okay, we'll share those things and we'll make sure that is that along with the videos and also the books, the, the, the series that you've been publishing with Aati. We would love to share them. Exactly. Yes. Wow, that's my Corazon de Cristal. Yes, I know. <laughs> and Garda un Secreto, right? Is that correct? Garda sí. un Secreto. Aati. A ti guarda un secreto. A guarda un secreto. Yes. So yeah, okay. we'll share some of those links. Um, it's amazing work. I've not seen it in any other place in any other language. And um, it's time so to say goodbye. But uh, please stay in touch. And if if there are a lot of questions you know, about Valeria's work, we can always do another follow-on session. I would love that. Thank okay. you very much. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.